The Alternative Natural Philosophy Association presents Clive Kilmister, Ted Bastin and David McGovern in conversation during the month of December 1992. The recording took place in Cambridge. How did you become interested in Eddington? I, I came across his mathematical theory of relativity at a relatively early age. Uh, I think I was 17, and I more or less digested that book without complete understanding. Um, and now, so that takes us round to the uh, 1941. Uh, so that's before Fundamental Theory was published. But what, what had been published in 1936 was the earlier book, Relativity Theory of Protons and Electrons. And I got hold of that as well, a library copy. Mm. Um, and see, I'm, I'm just emphasizing here, I, I was a naive youth at this time. And here was a, another book written by this authoritative man who had earlier expounded general relativity in mm. such a wonderfully clear form. So I naturally assumed that everything in this new book was properly, correctly and clearly stated and any lack of communication that it had with me was entirely my fault for being so bloody stupid. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I worked very hard at the book for a number of weeks, this is my introduction to it, then I had to put it on one side to take examinations in mathematics and so on. And so the thing stayed on one side until I became a postgraduate student. And then I, I got back to it again. Well, by, by that time, fundamental theory had also been published. So that led me, as Ted says, to want, it, want the library copy. Um, but it, it's an interesting example of the way that things go round in circles. In the last three years, I've been engaged on this semi-biographical study of Eddington's later years and how mm -hmm. he came to write those two books and it's been borne in on me in the last half of that period that the first book is the one that one really needs to go to to find out how it is that he got into that situation. And the second book is, well this is the view I'm putting forward anyway Ted, you, you, you may differ from it but uh, mm -hmm. You mean, yeah. when you say the first book, you mean the mathematical but theory of relativity? No, no, the, the relativity, relativity theory, of theory of protons, protons and electrons. electrons yeah. I think there one can see his ideas clearly. They've got terribly muddied by the time he wrote Fundamental Theory. Oh. Um, as, a, um, as a result of his feeling the need to appease, not to appease, um, to answer his critics in various mm. ways. And so the, uh, I now come round to thinking that the book I came across first was the, the one that w really repays study. Uh -huh. But I mean, from then onwards, uh, once I got in touch with Ted again, um, I think, uh, he's probably going to deny this, but I think he's the main driving force between what's produ been produced since. As far as I was concerned, uh, I found this ro book, Fundamental Theory, in the bookshops, and uh, <coughs> there was a way a very a way, but a very difficult to define way, uh, in of uh, thinking in that book, which uh, immensely appealed to me because it solved problems which had been, which had been, profoundly worrying me. I mean, I'd been trained as an experimental physicist and been appalled at the way that, um, on the one hand, electrons were said to have these these uh, fundamentally these profound. Uh, non-classical properties, and at the same time when, was at, when one was actually dealing with problems, one talked about them as billiard balls, and, uh, and this was horrifying, and I, I, it, it, uh, I wanted to find some way in which the nature of these things could be understood in a general framework, uh, uh, um, distinct from and separate from and different from the um, way in which they were artificially introduced, the discreteness was artificially introduced into the theory by imposing a, con um, a, a discrete value of uh, Planck's constant or and other constants as, as mathematical fiats, and then talked around them and tried to justify it with, with obvious lack of success. Um, <coughs> and Eddington seemed to give a new 
a new approach. Now, it's rather difficult to specify that approach, but of course, he, he, it did, uh, it, it did um, consist in his case, or hinge largely on, on the possibility of calculating in ways that were then castigated as being a priori, the, uh, the values of the coupling constants, or uh, the dimensionless constants, as they, as they were called. Um, this then led to scrutiny of, of this method, and although the whole fabric of the book was highly suggestive, uh, it didn't. It was not It was not satisfying because calculating uh, discrete numbers, essentially from dimension numbers of dimensions um, and uh, numbers of, of uh, um, elements in, in uh, dimensionally derived things like uh, uh, energy momentum tensors and products of those. Um, seemed um, not to be cogent because you were you were essentially talking about a continuum theory and, and mm -hmm. deriving numbers from them. Mm -hmm. So this led on to a, a, an interest which I suppose already existed in, in our minds. Um, uh, and I say our, because at this time we'd already made contact and had worked together and, mm -hmm. and I actually written papers together. Uh -huh. um, about what time was it that, that uh, you This was 1947, 48, yes. we first met. Yes. Clive well, that's when you met, went to get fundamental theory out of the college library, this was Queen mm -hmm. Mary College, uh -huh. and found that, that somebody else called Bastin had already oh. got it out. <laughs> right. So he, that, that's how we actually made contact. Though we'd actually been at school together, but as he was very well known as a mathematician and and, uh, and uh, two years older than I, I'd never dared to speak to him. Of course, he'd have no motivation to speak to me. So uh, we'd sort of uh, mm. been aware, I'd been aware of his presence. Um, but um, so then the, the, the hunt was on. What, what is the real reason why we say space is three-dimensional? This was a burning question. And that was the earliest of the questions. And we started to investigate what were then called algebraic theories. We should now call them combinatorial theories, or p possibly just discrete theories, mm. but where one was looking for an algebraic structure subsuming the um, the continuum theory, which was capable of modifying it. Then, with some influence uh, from Eddington, but but really largely of our own bat, we we um, were compelled to think in terms of generalizing or of extending a three-dimensional structure, which we which we supposed by that time we'd got some reasons for from the concept of order papers. Mm -hmm. uh, to put another clause into that sentence, or two more clauses, um, that that work was pref was was uh, had such strong analogies to your introduction of ordering concepts. I mean, it was not mm -hmm. for nothing. It was called a concept of order. Mm -hmm. So we, um, I can't remember the sentence, beginning of the sentence now. So I'll start again afresh. Uh, <coughs> The notion was of, of uh, uh, operators, a uh, new sets of elements which were which were operators upon that first set, and therefore were of a squared order, um, and which then would become elements of an, uh, of, a, of the same, essentially the same kind as the things they were operating on, at a different level. Mm -hmm. Thus, the notion of level was born, mm -hmm. and this this process could could in mm -hmm. principle be continued to 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 more mm -hmm. levels in a hierarchy. This seemed to be the only way out. I mean, of of getting from from the original discrete number from mm -hmm. the discrete number of dimensions which we got an algebraic ex understanding of. So we weren't just appealing to geometry um, and extending the system. But this is this is diverged a good long way from from the Eddington concept by that time. Um, notions had appeared, two notions of, an, of importance for later developments had already appeared. First, the, the strong notion of symmetry, which were called um, uh, similarity of position, uh, impossibility of um, attaching great importance to structures in which it was, from the, from the structure of the mathematics, impossible to define an order. Mm -hmm. um, and um, <coughs> also, a, um, a very strong concern with the nature of with what was involved in extrapolation in physics, uh, an idea which is quite cognate to, to yours, but doesn't it never seem to have play the same psychological part for you as it did for us. I mean, we were so concerned to see how does the classical description, how can it incorporate limits, um, and uh, the limits both on the cosmological scale, and the and the um, and on the quantum scale. 
Mm. And this prefigured all the kind of discussion we had the other day about the nature of the quantum particle and the okay. profound re revulsion, I mean revision, revulsion, revolution <laughs> of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of ideas, yeah. which, which <laughs> one had to, had to go through, and we, we, which one had to live through very painfully. So one is aware of the pain that it causes the conventional physicist to force him into that. Uh, at the same time, one feels it necessary to point out the necessity of that evolution to him. Um, so uh, those were the elements, I think, at the time that um, Parker Rhodes made this intrusion. Mm -hmm. I should say there was a previous, an intermediate stage where, where we were thinking strongly in digital terms, but actually using um, control systems. Mm -hmm. um, and Gordon Pask's intuition, Gordon Pask provided the control systems out of X WDX War Department stuff that was available uh, very cheaply after the war. And we had a room at least the size of this, which was entirely occupied by one control system, and it, it used about five kilowatts to run. It made whirring noises, and it started up in one place, and then the activity would transfer to the other, other parts. And it, uh, Pask's idea was that one could have a, sy a mechanical system which would incorporate all the possibilities, everything that could happen, given a random input, but, but uh, and, and in which also, by our strictures, uh, <coughs> the different elements on the set of the system, which were, when you say elements, each was about that size and vastly complicated, but they were elements in the sense that they were separable pieces, and they had this important property that they had to be made exactly like every other, which was actually difficult with that crude equipment. Uh, um, and he thought you could actually, you you could actually um, have a process it, um, which was capable of doing everything. A, a funny idea, and very related to modern ideas of chaos. Mm. Uh, mm. In fact, I think he yeah. was he was the originator in a real sense of the idea of mm. of the chaos notion that uh, from a very an, a, an, uh, an indefinitely small variation in two different parts, you could mm. you could you could stimulate That's the uh, yeah. indefinite mm. much greater active because he actually mm. used that. I mean, that was yeah. actually impl implemented in the hardware. Mm. As as two variables got nearer and nearer together, they gave each other a progressively larger kick uh, mm. uh -huh. into a different into a different form of behavior. Uh -huh. And it was all you saw the behavior of the system on on various arrays, sixteen fold four by four mm. arrays of lights, and there were sixteen randomizers. And, uh, and the, the thing chugged along. Um, Frederick Parker Rhodes and Ted were working in the early 60s together. And to put a, cut a long story short, Parker Rhodes claimed that Ted's attempt to construct a machine model of a system which had several levels and with numbers attached to the levels. He claimed that Ted's attempt to do this was essentially equivalent to the following algebraic construction. And this is the famous Frederick Parker Rhodes construction or the, the hierarchy construction. It simply goes like this. One's working, as I would say as a mathematician, over the field Z2, the field with two elements, naught and one, but in fact one's not doing very much of the multiplication part of the field, only the addition, uh, and the addition is just addition modulo 2, or what people in other branches call symmetric difference or whatever. So everything's, everything's what you think it will be except that 1 plus 1 equals naught. And uh, Parker Rhodes said, consider the following construction. I give this now with no explanation, exact, I mean, I, I'm saying no explanation. This is how it was presented to me by Parker Rose and by Ted when they came to have lunch with me to tell me about it. Um, one starts with two entities. Without loss of generality, we represent them by the two column vectors, say naught one and one naught. These two are linearly independent, linearly meaning in terms of this operation. If you add them together, you get another one, uh, that is 1, 1. It would have been just as good for the construction to choose these two as basic, and then that would have come by addition. But it's simpler to work with this standard one. The operation that we've called plus here 
tends to get called discrimination in this context. And the reason it's called discrimination is because that's what it does. It discriminates between the two things given on either side and tells you whether they're the same or different. If they're the same, it says north. <coughs> if they're different, it says one. This is the, it, the only interesting case of it. But of course, naught and naught give naught because they're the same, whereas naught and one and one and naught give one because they're different. So it discriminates between sameness and unsameness. Um, now, in terms of that discrimination operation applied at this level, one has what got called discriminately closed subsets. That means sets of elements which are such that if you take any two different elements in the set and do this on them, you finish up with another element in the set. They have to be different elements, so this closure is slightly different from what mathematicians call closure, where they would allow the two elements to be the same and then finish up with a naught. But we don't have any noughts in the system. So out of those two vectors, one can get three di discriminately closed subsets, to wit, one of the vectors by itself. Of course, this is the mathematician's usual sly trick. Having given you a definition, he then uses it in a context that you hadn't expected. Because of course, if you've only got one element in the set, you can't take two different elements, so the, the definition doesn't get used. So there's one element that one element set, that one element set, or the set which consists of those two taken together, in which case this one will have to be included as well in order to get the closure under discrimination. So those two give rise to three discriminately closed subsets. Now the essential of the, one essential of the Frederick construction is to say, well, let us now describe those discriminately closed subsets by single elements in the algebra by the following rule that these are vectors of length 2 I consider linear operators on those vectors in other words 2 by 2 square matrices and the rule by which um, a square matrix A will represent a particular set of elements say a set S of elements, a discriminately closed subset, is that when A of A sub S operates on any element, on any vector U, it gives U itself if and only if U is a member of S. This, this uh, in other, uh, Frederick put it that the proper eigenvectors of A are exactly the set S. And so for these two taken in the example, well, Frederick also applied an additional condition, which you might perhaps want to do without, but it turns out really doesn't make any difference. This additional condition is that the operator A is a non-singular operator. And if one then looks for the operators at that level, you find they're uniquely determined. The one which has that discriminately closed subset as that, that single one as its eigenvector is the square matrix 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. The only one with that is the square matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. And then, since these are the whole space, the only one is the identity operator, 1, 1, 0, 0. So the result of this strange construction of Frederick is that the three discriminately closed subsets at one level are replaced by three single elements at the next level. And these three single elements are being two by two matrices, are simply a vector space of dimension 4, and so could be written, if you prefer it that way, in some arbitrary way as column vectors. Say, by putting this column first and then that one, so you would generate three column vectors like this, and one naught naught one. Then Frederick says, 
here you have a similar situation to this one, except that the things have length four, and there are three of them. Similar situation to the top. To, the, to this situation here, yes. Well, that's already a. There, no, no, to oh, this. Oh, to that. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Sorry. Here there were two of them, and they were of length two. I mean, those two twos being a coincidence. Here they are of length four, and there are three of them. So that from these three, you could take, you could generate discriminately closed subsets. How many? Well, you either take them by themselves, or you take a pair and their discriminate closure, which is not that one. So you get three, you get three single ones, three sets arising from pairs, which will be sets with three elements in, and one where you take all three and do all the discriminations, and so you get seven elements. So there will be three plus three plus one, that is two cubed minus one by an obvious generalization. So there will be 2 cubed minus 1, that is 7 DC subsets, uh, whose members are vectors like this. You then ask to do the same operation as here, that is you look for 4 by 4 matrices, which form a vector space of dimension 16, and those 4 by 4 matrices are to be chosen in such a way that they're non-singular and that they have exactly those seven DC subsets as their proper eigenvectors. You are, so you want, the problem is to find seven such 4 by 4 matrices. And Frederick put the thing in this form, which I would alter nowadays, of saying, and choose them so that they are linearly independent. Make, make a choice. Um, you've got seven, there are 16 li linearly independent ones altogether, so it's not at all surprising that you can manage to find seven of those which remain li linearly independent or non-singular and have the appropriate eigenvalue property. It's something that would need doing, but it's not surprising. And this is actually the uh, the ability to do this lies at the back of what I was saying the other day in the fine structure calculation. In fact, if you just, there are 74,088 choices for these seven, and 83% of them are indeed linearly independent. So actually, if you just trusted to luck, you'd probably be all right. So then, uh, I won't draw any more on the board, but these seven operators are four by four matrices, and so are readily turned into vectors of length 16. So we now have seven vectors of length 16, and we go back into, I mean, we've now got a cycle. Um, they've been chosen linearly independent, so you go back to whatever stage it was, if I'd numbered them off, I could have just drawn an arrow. Um, from those seven, you generate the 2 to the 7th minus 1, which is 127 DC subsets. And you ask for linear operators on the vectors in question. Well, they're 16 vectors, so you need 16 by 16 square matrices. Uh, and of course, the space of 16 by 16 square matrices has dimension 256. So you are asking to find 127 linearly independent matrices out of a uh, 256 dimensional lot, which have exactly the right eigenvalue properties and which are non-singular. Uh, this was the point where there was an embarrassment, in, in a historical embarrassment, in that Frederick, we, I, and John Amson, who was in it at that time, we both thought Frederick had proved the existence of such 127, and he seemed to think either that it was obvious or that he'd told us about it and one of us had proved it. And this, this situation lasted for some 18 months until the horrible truth came out when we all met together that none of us proved it. And we, by that time, Pierre was on the scene as well. And we 
how, <laughs> we then had to do some quite hard work to prove it. Although actually it isn't very difficult, as I now realise, because we're asking to do it with 16 by 16 matrices, and in fact you could do it with 12 by 12. So the problem isn't as hard as it sounds as if it were, but um, the shoe is beginning to pinch because to find 127 when you've got 256 dimensions which satisfy all the conditions, it's gradually closing in. Um, and the next stage is then the last one because out of the 127 which you've found and chosen to be linearly independent, you then get 2 to the 127 minus 1, which is about 10 to the 38 um, DC subsets at the next level. And Frederick would say the, these are DC subsets of vectors of length 256, and the linear operators on those will then be um, 256 by 256 square matrices, that, that is a space of dimension 65,536. Or is it 350? No, I think that's right. Well, something of that order. It's not 36. Well, it must end in 6 anyway. Yeah, it's 56. 56. Oh, it must be, must be a 3 in there that's then. That's right. Is it? Yeah. Um, at any rate, uh, a moderately a moderate size sort of space, very much smaller than the 10 to the 38. And so if you look for these operators uh, corresponding to the 10 to the 38 DC subset, you will in fact be able to find operators satisfying the non-singularity and having the right eigenvectors, but you can't possibly get them to be linearly independent because there aren't anything like enough. And so the process as described by Frederick it has to stop at that point. Now, let's stand back a minute and see where we've got to. We, we have indeed uh, done what Frederick said he'd done as far as Ted's project was concerned. We, we have a system with levels, four levels in fact. Um, the relationship between these levels involves certain numbers and the cumulative total of the numbers, you, you get three operators at the first level, then you get seven more which makes ten, and then you get 127 more which makes 137, and then this cumulative total well, doesn't actually make very much difference to that last one. So that you get not only numbers, but numbers which physicists had, well some of which physicists had learnt to recognise and one could wish that they, they recognised them more. So that was the situation as it was described to me, I think I'm right in saying the early 60s. Mm. We, we were persuaded by Frederick that the, the, the great future lay in looking at strings of noughts and ones and linear operators operating on them. And when you do that, you can see that this, irrespective of the construction, the following situation will happen. Suppose you have a non-linear operator which might be part of the construction or it might not, um, A, and you operate on some vector u with it, so that starting with u, u will then get A of u. Uh, that will be another vector. So you can operate on that again and you get a squared operating on u, and so on. And this process is absolutely bound to terminate because the worst, that, the longest it can be is that it will chase through all the vectors in the space which are finite in number and finish up with u again at the end. And this is what we called at that time a cycle. The things must cycle. And we started to look at what possible cycle lengths there were at different size matrices. At, level, at the level of 4x4 four four matrices, it's actually very easy now. It didn't seem easy in 1963. It's curious the amount of work we did. But it, it's now very easy to see that the possible cycle lengths so the biggest one is 15 when it's gone through the whole lot. The next one down after 15 turns out to be 7. Um, 
and then I think, doing it from memory now, three and two, uh, four, three, two and one I think are possible. I can't remember about five, but maybe it is or not. Um, at any rate, there's a, a bit of an accumulation there and then a jump up to the maximum one. And I remember at the time I thought, oh, it's, a, it's an utterly wild thought, but this had somewhat uh, the appearance of the known spectrum of particle masses at that time. So I thought, oh, well, it would be nice to know what are possible cycle lengths at, at the higher levels, <coughs> when it's not quite so easy to work them out. And Ted spent quite a lot of time on a machine here which had some spare time at that time, if you remember, Ted, in <coughs> pr producing a program which churned out all the possible cycle lengths up to dimension, up to the 16 by 16 matrices. <coughs> and we have a printout of that somewhere. Uh, it turned out to be one of those ideas which runs into the sand because when you get up to the, <coughs> up to the 16 by 16 level, where the maximum cycle length is, is one less than this, uh, coming down from there, is, the next one is one less than that and so on. And it, it, uh, a rough statement is that almost every cycle length is possible. With, and it's not quite true, and there's one or two windows, but uh, rapidly the, the, the information comes and collapses on you. So um, that's, I just mentioned that as an example of the way in which at, in 1963 I, I was personally, I was just operating in the dark trying to think, well, here is this astonishing, peculiar construction with astonishing consequences in terms of numbers. What shall we do with it next? Um, and I, I can't actually put a date on the time when I started thinking differently about it. And the, the different way that I was thinking about it was uh, not just, well, what, what next can be done with it, as what on earth is it all about? What, what is the rationale behind the construction? How did one ever get into the position of, of doing a construction like that? And um, the difficulties which I saw, and this partly bears on the differences of approach, the, the difficulties I saw were this. Firstly, why do you want to use discrimination? So that's number one problem, discrimination. Then. Uh, supposing you are using that, why have you got these column vectors? Uh, that's not a very big one to answer. I mean, uh, bit strings are nothing really. But if you've got the column vectors, why should you be using linear operators? And when you're using the linear operators, which after all you could perhaps explain by once you've really justified the discrimination by saying you've got to preserve that, what does this eigenvector condition mean. That's a, a totally unexpected thing. Um, and then what should one say about replacing the sets at one level by o o uh, linear operators at the next level? Why should one be doing that? Um, Frederick put it in terms of economy, uh, principle of economy that one could talk about a large set more succinctly in terms of a single element at the next level. Um, I mean, that's true enough, but it doesn't seem to me very relevant, especially as I think up till now, apart from the numbers, I made no mention of physics, and I really want to see justifications which had a more, a more physical content than that. So those were the sort of problems which I, I thought were facing me, well, I probably can put a time on it, I say about up till 15 years ago, and the last 15 years have been uh, mulling over those problems and how one could present the, present the um, hierarchy in a different way so as to face those problems. Uh, now I think it's probably, I'm a bit, mm, um, it would be better to not, not to go into all that at the moment, but just draw attention to one particular aspect of it, which is, uh, it affects what we said mm. recently. That is, um, mm. my concern over um, the two different things here, the 
uh, use of linear operators to get from one level to the next, and the use of discrimination at each level. I answered my worries over that by showing how they could be subsumed under a single operation or a, a kind of more generalised discrimination operation. So that collapsed the two onto one for me, and, and that pleased me. Now the, the effect of that on you, David, I think, is <laughs> the opposite of pleasure, because yes. you, you had felt the nice cleanness between mm. doing one and then, and then <laughs> jumping, right. right? Yes, yes, that's right. Mm. Uh, it, it, uh, it, well, it was that, and it was also the, the uh, uh, I, I felt that by collapsing them into one, uh, you lost the, the reason for the closure. Yes, and I, thought that was quite I, I important. think so. Uh, yeah. Now, I did say this uh, uh. on another occasion, that um, I don't now see the closure, even in the Frederick construction, as being quite mm -hmm. so cogent as I did, mm -hmm. um, because it, it depends on this this slightly arbitrary requirement right. that you are going to draw your linear operators from a set of a particular dimension. Right. Uh, I mean, it, I say somewhat arbitrary because in the way in which Frederick originally presented the construction it's not at all arbitrary because mm. the objects in question are indeed vectors of a certain length. Yes. And if the operators are going to be linear then they must be matrices of that size. Right. And you need square but matrices. Yeah. So, yeah as well. They must be square, yes, yes. right. Um, but, yeah, so with, within Frederick's narrow context, that's, that's mm -hmm. all one... It, right. But that narrow context seems to me a bit narrow, so <laughs> that I I'm, I'm feel that um, one could... Re and, it, and it turns out, when one rephrases the thing, not, not, not I admit, particularly in terms of physics, but if you just see it as the necessary machinery for carrying out a process of, mm. of the type that Ted and I talk about. And, and here that doesn't bring in, I mean we, we certainly um, have physics in our sites all the time, mm. but it's not limited to physics. Then one th that process seems to dissolve away the rather, rather rigid dimensionalities here mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't make the closure not exist at all, but it makes it um, less hard and fast rule that mm -hmm. it absolutely stops. It, it says, God, something terrible happens at this level. <laughs> <But> <coughs> okay, mm. well, shall I, mm. do you want to say anything in response to that? No, I, I, you know, I, I think that you're... <laughs> Probably my worries are, are a little bit stronger than yours, but they're of the same nature. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've always... Uh, well, it took me quite a long time when I first was introduced to the hierarchy to understand uh, some kind of justification for Frederick's construction and to understand the bits. I, I, I did a, a great deal of, of, uh, of uh, reading <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> linear algebras to try and think of what all the the critical factors were and which yeah. ones made sense and which ones were sort of irrelevant and uh, uh, but I, I think part of the reason why I thought it was cleaner to to pull some of those things out uh, to see the separate sequence was just that that they are a little bit arbitrary and I, I think mm. that's what makes physics physics is that, that you've picked yes. particular kinds of features. That could yeah. be, yes. I mean, one thing, i just close by saying this, that um, one thing Frederick did do was to try other possibilities. That is, instead mm -hmm. of starting uh, with everything modulo 2, mm -hmm. he tried modulo 3, or mm -hmm. other numbers. Mm -hmm. And instead of starting with two elements, you started with more. Mm -hmm. None of those things give a four-level right. hierarchy. Right. You sometimes get two levels, usually it collapses before that. Uh -huh. So there's a certain uniqueness about the construction yeah. of, uh, of one that's very hard to put exactly into words, but mm -hmm. it, one can only say well, there's no other way of getting a hierarchy, almost. Right. Yes, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, uh, how have you done much in the way of looking at um, how the, the hierarchy changes, what, what additional degrees of freedom one does have um, when you collapse the two sequences into a single one, into a single process. Let me put it mm -hmm. that way. Because uh, one of mm. the questions I raised to you the other day was, um, it appears to me then that some of the justification uh, 
for having these particular levels, getting these particular numbers now becomes much more difficult. It mm -hmm. looks like you've got a bit too much freedom by doing that. Um, and I was wondering if you uh, explored that. No. No. No, okay. it's not. Yeah.